My name is Vicki Tagalakis. I'm Division Director of General Internal Medicine at McGill University, Montreal, Canada, and I am a thrombosis physician specialist. I specialize in the treatment and management of thrombotic disorders. Case study anticoagulation duration of treatment. Mr. B is a 54-year-old man who is a radiology technologist married with two teenage kids. He presents to the emergency department with chest pain and shortness of breath of one day duration. His past medical history consists of hypertension and benign prostatic hyperplasia. His medications include omlodipine and tomsolucin. Here we have his exam and investigation. Uh, specifically, his vitals are relatively uh, uh, stable with a saturation of 93% on room air. His chest exam is clear, his cardiovascular exam is normal, and uh, there is no edema. Investigations reveal that his laboratory uh, uh, lab investigations show a normal, complete blood cell count, a creatinine clearance of 65 mls per minute, chest x-ray is normal, and an EKG is normal, sinus rhythm. Given that he has a chest pain um, and presenting to the emergency room, a scoring system, a pretest probability scoring system for pulmonary embolism is applied. And here we see the modified well scoring uh, clinical criteria for assessment of pulmonary embolism. There are others that can be used uh, as well. Uh, uh, but the Wells uh, modified scoring system has been shown to be quite sensitive and specific vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, providing a pretest probability for pulmonary embolism. He scores moderate risk on the Wells score. His D-dimer is 750, and so the emergentologist goes ahead and does a CT angiogram, which confirms segmental left upper lobe pulmonary embolism. What would you do now? These are the initial treatment options, A through H. Moreover, consider this question. Does Mr. B need to be admitted to hospital? There are several factors to consider when a patient is being assessed as to whether he or she should go home uh, or discharge from, from the emergency department with an acute PE. Uh, there have been different scoring systems that have been developed and have been uh, used to determine prognosis of pulmonary embolism. Uh, and some of these scoring systems, uh, for example, the high stack criteria, have been looked at to see whether they are useful in helping determine whether a patient can be di discharged home or not from the emergency department. Here I show you the uh, questions or criteria that are involved in the high stack criteria, 1 through 11. And there was a study recently done in 2013 uh, which looked at 275 patients with acute symptomatic PE, and they were selected for treatment as outpatients based on the high stack criteria. Uh, and those patients were compared to the 221 that were treated as inpatients. And what was noted was that the adverse events uh, were 4.5% uh, in the inpatients and zero adverse events in the outpatients. The adverse events were measured up to 30 days following discharge and included things such as uh, return to uh, emergency department, uh, PE recurrence, and death. Of note, though, of the patients that were treated at home, in fact, 35% were normal tensive, but did have RV dysfunction on their echo. So this suggests that treating PE patients at home or discharging them from the emergency department, certain patients, uh, it can be done in a safe manner and an efficacious manner. Uh, in fact, outpatient management of pulmonary embolism is safe in about 20 to 30 percent of patients, and these are the patients that are hemodynamically stable, they have no need for supplemental oxygen, they have no significant comorbidities, uh, they have no contraindications to anticoagulation, uh, they're able to obtain daily anticoagulation, they have adequate pain control and social support. Um, here we provide an initial 
uh, approach to the treatment of venous thromboembolism from days 5 to 10 when the patient presents with venous thromboembolism. Uh, the first thing to determine is whether or not the patient is stable. If they are stable, and depending on uh, what uh, uh, VT they have, if it's a DVT or a P with good prognosis, they can generally be treated in the outpatient setting. If they have a P with poor prognosis, uh, and here is where a scoring system can be applied, such as the high spec criteria or the PESI score, that's another score that can be applied and has been used to determine 30-day mortality risk as well. These patients should ideally be hospitalized and should be hospitalized uh, and to receive their anticoagulant therapy. If the patient is unstable, well, clearly the patient will then be hospitalized, and depending on whether or not uh, the pulmonary embolism is of hemodynamic significance, uh, rendering the patient quite unstable, thrombolysis may be instituted. Uh, if there is an absolute contraindication to anticoagulation, that the patient has uh, acute bleeding, for example, or acute major bleeding, then an IVC filter should be considered. So on this, on this uh, slide, we have the uh, PESI score and the simplified PESI uh, score, both of which are available on the Thrombosis Canada website uh, and app uh, as a tool uh, that can be used to uh, help uh, physicians in the emergency department uh, determine 30-day mortality risk with uh, the pulmonary embolism. Um, and just like the HISTA score, it also has been looked at in different uh, management studies uh, to determine uh, whether or not a patient can be discharged home from the emergency department. Mr. B scored low on his PESI score, and so, so as a result, he was discharged home with a prescription for a Pixaban uh, for at least three months. His appointment was arranged in four weeks to discuss duration of therapy uh, with the physician in the clinic. Uh, he was seen as planned at four weeks. He, he reported that he was doing well, and he had had no bleeding complications on the Pixaban, and there was resolution of all his symptoms. A discussion is then had with Mr. B regarding how long to treat uh, his venous thromboembolic episode. So duration of therapy for acute venous thromboembolism uh, can be broken down into an initial phase, the three-month phase or long-term phase, and then followed by the extended phase. So in the initial phase, the first five to seven days post-BT diagnosis, Options include a direct oral anticoagulant alone, such as rivaroxaban or apixaban, or uh, the use of low molecular weight heparin, followed by vitamin K antagonist, or one of the uh, DOACs uh, that require low molecular weight heparin up front, uh, these being adoxaban and dapicatran. In the long-term phase, we then either use DOAC monotherapy or vitamin K antagonist uh, monotherapy, and uh, the question then becomes is, uh, do we go beyond three months? So what is the three months uh, all about? Uh, well, both the three months and the long-term phase, uh, the long-term phase and extended phase, um, the importance of this is to prevent recurrence of venous thromboembolism, to prevent the post-thrombotic syndrome, and to prevent chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. In the initial phase or the initial treatment, that's when we're dealing with the acute clot, and that's where we're trying to use our anticoagulant to stop propagation of the clot, so for a DVT to extend and propagate and embolize uh, to the lungs, so therefore preventing embolism, and, that, and hence protecting, protecting the pulmonary circulation and restoring venous return. Factors that come into play for extending therapy beyond the, in, the, the mandated initial three months for all patients uh, come, uh, are, are, are based on understanding the risk of recurrence of venous thromboembolism versus the risk of bleeding on an anticoagulant. So it depends on, uh, on these two factors and figuring out or determining for your patient um, where, where the balance lies, uh, and at the same time, uh, trying to ascertain uh, patient preference 
Uh, do they want to continue with anticoagulation, understanding their risks and or benefits? Uh, if their lifestyle perhaps does not uh, sort of uh, is not in line with uh, with pursuing an anticoagulant, for example, uh, high uh, patients who are involved in high impact type of sports where the risk of bleeding may uh, outweigh the risk of recurrence, for example. And so all these factors have to come into play. And so when we're trying to determine uh, what to do at the three month mark, um, we like to divide our uh, venous thromboembolic events uh, into the category of unprovoked versus provoked. And why we do that is that we know that um, venous thromboembolic events that are provoked um, by a major risk factor such as surgery, uh, where major surgery in fact, where there's an administration of a general anesthetic for over 30 minutes of the surgery, or bedridden or immobilized for over three days, uh, such as a hospitalization. In those patients, once that risk is removed, at three months, uh, the risk of recurrence is quite low. It, it's around one to two to three percent. Um, however, in patients where such a, a major risk factor is not found, so we're looking at a risk factors such as mild surgery or a mild illness or injury where immobilization is not that long, then those are called mildly provoked. Um, and those uh, also fall under the category of um, potentially being uh, extended therapy beyond the three months. And then we have a venous thromboembolic event where the risk factor persists. And uh, persisting risk factor that's quite commonly seen is cancer. And cancer can cause um, the risk of thrombosis to uh, be quite uh, uh, persisting, and hence patient uh, risk of recurrence is high once they come off the anticoagulant. So if we have to summarize, uh, when a patient develops a venous thromboembolism in the first um, a goal is to treat initially to prevent propagation and embolization and restore venous patency. And then we treat for three months minimum uh, for everyone uh, to prevent recurrence. Um, and then uh, the, we would stop in certain individuals at three months, and those would be patients with a thrombotic episode where it was majorly provoked by a factor that is a strong provoking factor. Uh, because we know the risk of recurrence uh, is quite low for those individuals, uh, and hence uh, it would be relatively safe to stop anticoagulation. But in other individuals where the factor that provoked the venous thromboembolism is minor, or there's a persistent risk factor, or there's no uh, identifiable uh, factor, such as a completely unprovoked venous thromboembolism, then that risk of recurrence uh, is significant enough to consider continuing anticoagulation. So the ACCP guidelines, the American Association uh, of uh, Chest Physicians, has looked at this and uh, they suggest that uh, anticoagulants be given for a short term, three and maybe up to six month therapy for patients with provoked by major transient strong temporary risk factor, they recommend stopping anticoagulation at three months. So these are provoked by major surgery, provoked by significant immobilization, provoked by trauma where, where the patient is immobilized for long periods of time, for example. In patients with an unprovoked or weakly provoked by a transient risk factor, uh, they suggest that anticoagulant should be continued indefinitely in patients with a non-high bleeding risk, and this is a grade 2B weak recommendation. And they, they also recommend to stop anticoagulation patients with a high bleeding risk at three months. This is a grade 1B recommendation. Um, and so when dealing with an unprovoked or weakly provoked transient risk factor, then one needs to balance that risk of bleeding versus that risk of recurrence. And how does one determine major bleeding? Well, major bleeding risk prediction rules exist for VT patients uh, on and off anticoagulants. 
uh, but they're not, uh, they exist for atrial fibrillation, but less specific for venous thromboembolism. Uh, there's no specific uh, bleeding risk prediction rule for patients with venous thromboembolism that has been well validated. So often, um, one uses the has blood score, for example, which has been validated for atrial fibrillation, and so it can be used for venous thromboembolism. And a score of 0 to 2 on the has blood is considered low risk of bleeding, and a score of 3 or more is considered a high risk of bleeding. Um, and one should note that the has blood score was developed in the era of warfarin and not in the era of direct oral anticoagulants. So one would be cautious to, to remember that it may not perhaps be as validated when considering a patient with direct oral anticoagulants and determining their major bleeding. Uh, generally, the rate of major bleeding on vitamin K antagonists is thought to be 2 to 3% per year on average, and that's for the average individual. It can be up to 10% in patients with many risk factors. Uh, that are scored on the house blood, such as advanced age and renal failure, for example. Uh, this is l likely less with direct oral anticoagulants, but 2 to 3% per year on average, uh, especially low dose direct oral anticoagulants, which uh, is often the low dose is what is recommended for long term secondary prevention. Low doses being things like a fixaban 2.5 BID and rivaroxaban 50 milligrams once a day. Uh, here is the has blood score for major bleeding, and as you can see here, um, the factors that are included in, in the has blood score, and this too can be found on the Thrombosis Canada website. Uh, here we have uh, some uh, average risks of bleeding, uh, of recurrence, sorry, following cessation of anticoagulation. As I mentioned before, uh, when we're looking at the different uh, factors, if it's a major provoking risk factor, the risk per year following uh, stoppage of anticoagulation at three months is around 2 to 3 percent. A weekly provoking factor, it's around 6 to 8 percent. And in patients with an unprovoked blood clot where there's no risk factor identified, the risk per year is around 10 to 15 percent following cessation of anticoagulants. And in patients with uh, ongoing risk factors, such as active cancer or antiphospholipid syndrome, the risk per year can be up to 25 to 30 percent. So here we have an approach to long-term and extended treatment of venous thromboembolism. So after the initial therapy, many societies endorse this treatment algorithm. Uh, and as you can see here, we identify which category of venous thromboembolism our patients falls into. If they are provoked by transient risk factor, especially a major risk factor, then anticoagulation is stopped after three months. If it's uh, cancer associated and the cancer is persistent in general, a minimum of six months is recommended and longer if the cancer is active. Uh, if the patient has an unprovoked venous thromboembolism, and this is where uh, the default is usually to recommend indefinite anticoagulant therapy uh, versus uh, to, to preferentiate indefinite versus three to six months of anticoagulant therapy. However, uh, there are certain groups in the unprovoked that could benefit from stoppage at three to six months, and this is in patients who have a high risk of bleeding. One would preferentiate stopping at between three to six months of anticoagulant therapy. Or in women at low risk of recurrence, there has been a scoring system that has been developed and validated extensively that can be applied to women with an unprovoked venous thromboembolism. And it has been shown that in women who score low on this score, which is called the HER2 rule, uh, also found on Thrombosis Canada website and app. Uh, if, if a woman scores low on this score, then, uh, then their risk of recurrence is, falls down to around 2% uh, following anticoagulant therapy, which is very similar to the provoked by transient risk factor group. And so stopping anticoagulation in these women at three to six months uh, would be uh, favored. 
finally, uh, in patients with isolated distal deep vein thrombosis, so these are individuals where the thinking is that their risk of extension is less than a patient with a proximal DVT or subsegmental pulmonary embolism and low risk of recurrent VTE individuals, then clinical surveillance or three months of anticoagulant therapy is being proposed. But this is a more controversial area uh, and probably outside the scope of this talk today. So if we return to our patient, uh, we applied the half-blood score to Mr. B and he scores low. Because he had an unprovoked venous thromboembolism, and because he is male, and hence we cannot apply the HERDU2 score, which only applies to women, uh, we feel confident that indefinite anticoagulation should be recommended to this individual because if we do stop anticoagulation, his risk of recurrence of a venous thromboembolism is around 10% per year. After six months of full dose of Pixaban, there's good data to suggest that the dose of DOAC, in fact, can be reduced. Uh, this comes from the Amplify extension and the Einstein choice studies, which showed low dose apixaban and low dose rivaroxaban were effective for reducing BT recurrence and no excess bleeding when compared to placebo. So yes, uh, extend beyond uh, the initial three months uh, to six months, and uh, the option exists to extending with a lower dose of the direct oral anticoagulant. Uh, here we have the example uh, of the HERDU2 rule for discontinuing, discontinuing anticoagulation in unprovoked venous thromboembolism in women, um, and it depends on assessing the science for signs of post-thrombotic uh, signs, uh, D-dimer level, the BMI, and age. Uh, it's used in women over 80 years of age with unprovoked VTE. Uh, you should not use it in patients with any of the following uh, because these were patients that were originally excluded uh, from the initial development and validation of the HER2. Uh, here we have an example, a, a, a table depicting the trial, all the DOAC trials with apixaban, dabigatran, rivaroxaban in venous thromboembolism with the results for the extended VTE treatment. So um, these patients were looked at in the Amplify extension using the 2.5 milligram BID, uh, which is the lower dose, and compared to placebo. And uh, we see that recurrence was, uh, uh, was reduced by 81% when compared to placebo. Uh, similarly, we see with the lower dose of a, uh, of, uh, Rivaroxaban uh, uh, was similarly seen, although uh, the, 10, the 20 milligram once a day. Since Mr. B was started on a Pixaban, we did decrease his dose to 2.5 milligrams twice a day at six months. Uh, he, he will require, however, a yearly assessment and follow-up for renal function measurement uh, because direct oral anticoagulants do uh, require uh, renal, uh, uh, do depend on some renal elimination. So uh, if ever there is a decrease in renal function, this can impact on the direct oral anticoagulant concentration uh, in the blood. And so uh, one would want to make sure to follow their renal indices for the duration of therapy. And this is important because we want to ensure that the bleeding risk always remains low. If he does acquire new bleeding risk factors, then the risk-benefit ratio exercise needs to be readdressed again. So what if Mr. B was 75 years of age with the same presentation, but he now has a history of seizures and is on phenytoin? How would you treat him? For me, it's very clear that direct oral anticoagulants uh, are known to have certain drug-drug interaction. Uh, specifically, anti-epileptics such as phenytoin is one of the drug interactions that has been described uh, with a direct oral anticoagulant. And so it would be uh, a quite uh, um, uh, concerning to me to uh, start uh, 
a, a directoral anticoagulant in this case if the patient is on phenytoin, and I would preferentiate a vitamin K antagonist for long-term therapy in this individual. Uh, one other option is to reconsider the phenytoin with a neurologist and see if potentially there could be another uh, medication that can be used to manage a seizures that does not have any uh, foreseeable or for, uh, known interactions with direct oral anticoagulant. Um, but in general, uh, it's clear that even though direct oral anticoagulants when compared to warfarin have a lot less interactions with other medications, there are certain interactions that, that do still exist, that do occur, and uh, phenytoin is one of them. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for your time.